Are you getting into cybersecurity and want to learn more about Splunk? Or you recently just landed a new security analyst position and need a quick rundown on how to Splunk? Then make sure to stick around this video because we're going through the basics of Splunk and understanding how event logs and indexes work and also writing your own search queries. The first thing we need to understand is what is Splunk? Splunk is a scene which stands for Security Information and Event Management. The purpose of Splunk is to have a central platform where you can receive inputs from multiple log data sources for more monitoring and alerting purposes. The next thing we need to understand is what is a log? A log is an event that contains multiple fields which represents the specifics of the event. For example, let's say you went grocery shopping. This would be an event which contains fields like the time of entry, what you bought, your name, the store you went to, and the type of payment you used. This type of log format is quite common and is heavily used in cybersecurity. Okay, with that out the way, let's hop into Splunk for some examples. Alright, so if you look at an example here, you can see that this event is actually a raw event. So this means that there is no processing or filters involved. So if we look at the source field, we can see the type of data that's involved here. And that gives us an idea of what kind of search we can build. On Splunk, we can ingest different types of data like CSV, JSON, and XML. Splunk is pretty smart in distinguishing the format. So generally, you don't have to specify it when you're ingesting the logs. The next thing we need to understand is how we're storing these logs. Whenever we ingest the data, they are stored in specific specific indexes. So what is an index? You can think of an index like an individual database. So we can think of Splunk as a massive data warehouse storing numerous individual databases which are represented by indexes, which then stores very specific log data which are represented as events. Now that we have run through what logs are and how they are stored, we need to understand how we receive the data. There are multiple ways to receive data. One way is to manually upload. All right, so let's create a new index and show you an example of how we can manually ingest the data into Splunk. So we can just put in an index name here. Let's do a test ingestion. And we just leave everything as it is. I just hit save. Now we can see it down here. Let's create an example of CSV. So I'll go into notepad. And here we can just create a random CSV data. So let's just do field A, field B, field C. And then we can do something like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, then just hit save. And let's just save it to the downloads folder and just type in test ingestion.csv. So now we can go into settings and add data. And then we can click on upload files from my computer, drag and drop this CSV in here and hit next. And you can see it's auto detecting it's a CSV source type, so that's pretty good. And then we just hit next. And then let's just drop it into our test ingestion index and just hit review and just hit submit. All right, so now that's been done, let's go into the search. So we go index equals test underscore ingestion. And here we have the event. Another way is through apps. So if we go into find more apps, we can see a lot of apps here that we can configure. And once we've configured and installed everything accordingly, it'll automatically send the logs over. The most common way of ingesting from endpoints like computers and servers is through a universal or a heavy forwarder. This is Splunk's method of forwarding the data by by installing the forwarder on the endpoint, which automatically runs in the background to constantly send log data to the index. Okay, for the next section on search queries, let's use another example of log data. I'm going to use this example data set. This is a public Git repository that provides you a lot of different data source types. So you can see here, we've got a lot of AWS stuff, which is good for practice. We also have Microsoft logs. So I've went ahead and installed this already in preparation for this video. So let's go ahead and do some search. So it's sitting in this index here called bots v3 and I'll set the earliest to zero because I want everything and here we can see we've been given a lot of data and looking at the source type we can see a lot of different ones here we can look at the source type and let's pick an example for our search query so let's select stream IP the key goal when we're looking through logs is to identify which fields are useful and can help us do our jobs more efficiently all right so now we can see a lot of different fields here this provides us an idea of what kind of search we can build so if got the destination IP and we've got the destination MAC address of the devices. So this kind of data is useful for us when we're trying to investigate an end user device like
like a laptop or maybe a phone. So this helps us narrow down on where we can start searching. We also have the source IP and the source MAC address. So looking at these fields here, I can just formulate questions in my head. Questions like who's accessed this particular device and I can get this kind of information from the source MAC address and the source IP. And let's click on five more fields to see if we missed out on anything else. Some bytes, timestamp, and I think that's pretty much it. Alright, so now that we've understood what kind of data we're dealing with, we can start building our search query. Splunk uses SPL, which is quite similar to SQL, so we can navigate around the logs and create useful searches. We know we have the source IP, source MAC, destination IP and destination MAC address, we can start to build a table. So we can just do something simple like the table function and then throw in the time, source IP, source MAC address, destination IP and destination MAC address. All right, so now we can see the results. There are missing data in the field source MAC address and the destination MAC address. So what we can do here is to refine the base search even more. We can do something like source MAC equals star, which means it needs to have a value and destination MAC with the same thing. These are the initial filters which can significantly improve the performance of the search if you apply them in the beginning. The reason for that is if you're doing a search on a particular field right at the end of the query, this will search through everything that exists in the index first, then do whatever processing that you have specified, and then search on the fields that you actually need. As you can probably imagine, this is very inefficient as you're performing all the unnecessary actions on the data that you don't even need. So by placing the filter right at the start, you can pretty much improve the efficiency of the search right off the bat. Alright, so now we can see a lot of duplicate IP addresses. So the next step we can do is just to see how many times this source IP address appeared. So we can do something like stats count by source IP and the source MAC address. And let's refine this even more by throwing in a sort by the count. So this is going to show in descending order. All right, so here we can see there's about 444 results returned, but we don't really need all of them. We probably only want the top 10, so we can do something like hit 10. So that's just gonna return the first 10 results. So now that we have this result here, we can probably add more data to it. So I'm thinking of adding some geographical data to this source IP. So what we can do here is use IP location on the source IP. Here we can see there's a lot of blank data here. We can just refine it even more. So let's just remove the hit 10 here. And then we can do a search on the country to filter out the non-null values. So we can do equals the star. All right, so now we can see the values are coming in. We can just add back in the top 10. Okay, so now we have all these results here, but we're missing a key information. We don't know the activity time of this source IP. So what we can do here is go into the stats function and just add in the latest time so we can figure out the latest event that happened with this source IP. That's time. All right, so now in the results, we can see we have the time field but we might not need every other field like the latitude and the longitude. So let's just do a bit of a cleanup. I'm going to move this table down here and then I'll leave the time here. I'll leave the source IP, the source MAC address. I'll include the count. I'll delete the destination IP and destination MAC because we don't have that. And I might just add in country. So this simplifies everything. Let's say this is the final search that we want. We can just save this as a macro so we can use it later. So what we can do here is go into settings and then I'm going to click advanced search. And I'm going to search macros. You can see we have existing macros here. So I'm gonna click new search macro. I'm going to copy this search here, drop it in the definition. And I could just name it something like top 10 source IP and just hit save. And here we have it. We have saved up our search. And the good thing about this is we can just search this string here, which brings up the exact same search as we did before. We add in this dash, top 10 source IP, dash, and we can see this is showing the exact same result as before. So if you're a programmer, then you can think of this macro as a variable that you can save to be used later. So let's make this search even more useful. Let's say this is your network traffic and you want to monitor it to make sure that there's no suspicious activity going on. That means that if you have a high number of count for a particular source IP, 
that could indicate that it's suspicious or there's something going on. So what you want to do here is just to create an alert for a particular threshold. So let's say our threshold is 100 count. What we can do here is do a search count more than 100. And here we can see this is the only source IP address with the count more than 100. And what we can do here is save as alert. And then we can just name this alert to something like suspicious IP. The good thing about this is we can add an action which sends an email or maybe a script. So an example here, we can just pop in our email, we can just pop in the subject and just type in the message that you want. And we can even attach a CSV or PDF of the result. Now I'm going to show you how to create a dashboard on this search here. So I can create a dashboard and I'll just name it something like suspicious IP. And let's just select classic dashboards because that's just the easiest. Okay, so let's enable dark mode because that's easier on our eyes. All right, so now that we have the dashboard created, let's go back to the search and click save as an existing dashboard. And we can find it right here and save the dashboard. Now we can just go back here and do a refresh. And here we can see the exact search here in the panel. So what we can do here is allow more customizations for the search. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just remove some filters on the existing search. So I'm going to remove hit 10 and then hit apply. So now it's gonna show everything. So I'm going to add in an input and the first thing I wanna add in is the time range. So I'm just gonna name it time range. So the next thing I want to add in is for the source IP. This is for the case if I wanna search for a particular IP address. So I'm gonna add that in, label that as source IP token. I'm just gonna leave it as IP token. Default, I'm just gonna put in the wildcard. All right, so the next thing is adding this token into our search query. So I'll copy that. So I want to add it to the base search, which is this first line here. So I'm going to type in source IP equals dollar dollar and then throw in the token name here. And then I'm gonna throw in a submit button here and then hit save. All right, so let's say we're searching for a particular IP address. For example, this one down here, I'll copy that, drop that here and then hit submit. And this is going to isolate that particular IP address for you so you can do your investigations a lot easier. And we can do the same thing for the source MAC address, count and country. So what I'm gonna do is just add input text and then just do source MAC address, MAC token. So I'm gonna add it in this search as well. I'm going to replace this part with the token. Same thing with the count, copy that. For count, we need to add it at the bottom because this is where we generated the field. So we need to throw it into this search here. Count equals count token. And last but not least, the country. Country token. And I'm going to replace that down here. So now if we delete that and hit submit, it should return to the default search. And let's say we want to search for United States. Oh, that didn't work. So let's see what's going on. Oh, we need to add in quotes. Okay, so now that worked. And let's say we want to search for a particular account more than 100. And I just realized I need to fix this count up. So let's go down here and put in more than the token. Hit apply, save. And this should show us all the count that's above 100 and in United States. So having a dashboard like this is really helpful when you're performing an investigation so you don't have to build your search from the bottom up every time. Okay, that's it from me on this video. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I'll try to stick to a video posting schedule, but I'm still trying to balance my full-time job and being a content creator. Anyway, check out my channel for more content like this.